Hi, this is Ida Nelson, and you are watching Purple Music Podcast. Bienvenidos a Purple Music, el primer podcast en español sobre Prince, su música, su arte y su legado. This is the dawning of a new podcast revolution. Time to get funky. So hi everyone and welcome to Purple Music. We are very happy to welcome here today to none other than Ida Nielsen, an amazing bass player as well as composer and of course Prince's former bass play bass player and also a member of his band Thera Girl. So hello, Ida, and welcome hello. to Purple Music. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to have you. Thanks a lot for, for being here today. And Ida, first of all, uh, we hope you have recovered well from COVID. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you were actually in the middle of your European tour with your band, The, the Fun Bots. Yes. Uh, but you will be on tour again in June and July. And yes. which countries are you visiting? Well, actually, um, already here by the end of May, we'll be going to Greece, to Athens. And in June, we'll be uh, in Brazil. Cool. And uh, July, we'll be a little bit uh, around Europe. We'll be in, uh, let's see, I don't forget anything. We'll be in uh, Germany and Denmark and Sweden. and. Um, France and yeah I think that's it a couple of places in Germany a couple of places in France well uh by the way there are a lot of Spanish fans looking forward to seeing you here in in Spain and Spain of course yes <laughs> yeah as far we knew we knew something but we wanted you to confirm that you are visiting one of of our cities uh yeah. yet to be announced so, <laughs> so but anyway, this is a call to all Spanish venues and promoters. Please make us happy, bring Ida Nielsen to Spain this summer. Yeah. But uh, Ida, for those lucky people who are attending to your shows, what kind of show will you be offering? Well, it's a high energy funk show uh, with lots of, uh, yeah, Good vibes, lots of tight grooves, and uh, for the purple people, there's a little bit of some subtle uh, references, uh, but mainly it's going to be uh, a mixture of uh, of all my music from all my albums. Okay, and what can you tell us about your band? Who are the Funk Boats? The Funk Boats is um, as a it's like a blend of different people so it depends a little bit so it's a little bit like it was at the mpg it, it changes sometimes right. but for uh this summer uh shows it's going to be uh my good friend and the uh, good old friend uh patrick dorsan on drums it's going to be oliver inquist on guitar uh fong lee on keys and uh i think also we're gonna have um, Kugo Agami, the rapper. Mm -hmm. And for one of the shows, or maybe I'm not quite sure, there's definitely, there's also gonna be actually a saxophone player called Jakob Elfström instead of uh, Fung Lee on keys. So it's it's a little bit uh, fluid. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ida, what is your musical background and how did you become a bass player? Um, the Bass uh, was a little bit of a coincidence. Um, I, I grew up uh, playing piano and then I was very lucky. I grew up in the countryside in Denmark and uh, I went to a school with a very enthusiastic music teacher. So uh, she was uh, like, we had some after school choirs and stuff like that. And um, that it just, uh, you know, it kind of just opened my passion for music. And um, 
so at the at a point the the school got a, a drum kit and a, an electric bass and we all got a chance to try it out if if we wanted to and uh, i actually preferred to play drums mm. so uh, that was kind of my thing but then i also could play a little bit of bass and then one day a girl from the choir she was in a band and they had a concert and their bass player just quit and she was she asked hey do you want to jump in and I was like well why not <laughs> so um yeah I tried that and uh I didn't like it so much <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I didn't like the music they were playing so much but at that same concert there was a band of young boys and they played funk music mm. and I loved it and the bass player was just like mm, I was going <laughs> all in and I, and after that I I kind of tried to do some stuff myself uh to see if, if I can also uh yeah to try to imitate what he was doing and then from then on it it, it was just the bass mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And what, what are your biggest influences as a bass player? Oh, <laughs> there's so many. You know, it's of course uh, Larry Graham, Marcus <laughs> Miller, Victor Wood, and Jacob Astorius, mm -hmm. Rocco Prestia, mm -hmm. Flea, and of course uh, <laughs> Prince. There's, mm -hmm. And, you know, I always forget some, but there's so many great bass players, and there's so many who were like creating like a new way of playing bass. And I, I feel like I'm a product of all of that because that's how you become a musician. It's a little bit, everything you listen to is, uh, you become a, a, a product of that. So there's all that, but then there's also, because um, I also like to uh, play other instruments and that's actually quite also a big influence for me. And uh, because I like to play like melodic stuff and and play pretty bass in a way you would maybe play another instrument but it's also possible to do on bass so um uh, yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay um about larry larry graham how yeah. did you feel when you had the chance to share the stage with him yeah man it was fantastic <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, he's like he's like he's like the first and yes. Mr. You know the Godfather of funk with the you know, uh, yeah. So that was a big deal. And then, uh, you know, now I met him many times, and it's mm. it's just very cool. You know, he was just totally the creator of of a bass style. And yes. you know, he's just like if if you really want to go back to like the roots of funk, you gotta listen to some uh, Larry Graham. So mm. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, some years ago, you had the chance to create your own signature bass with yeah. Samberg, a beautiful bass, by the way. And Thank you. How, how did you feel about it, about it? Oh, that was, you know, that's such a privilege to get to do that mm -hmm. because it, you know, I, I could just, uh, um, yeah, you know, it, <laughs> I, at the time when I created it, I wanted it to fit Third Eye Girl because Donna also had a black and gold guitar and I was like, <laughs> I, you know, we're all going to line up and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so those were the colors uh, I chose. And, um, and then it was, you know, I wanted a bass that, that sounded good for funk and rock because that was mm -hmm. what I, I played. And I, you know, I, I got to spent three days just trying out different pickups and positions and all that, you know, that mm -hmm. you normally never get to do as, as a, you know, you just go to the store and find the bass you like, but this was really, you know, made for after my wishes. So that's sure. a, a luxury mm -hmm. and, a, you know, I'm very grateful that, that mm -hmm. I, I got to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have published four solo albums uh, up to now. Well, actually, five. Five. Oh, five. <laughs> because, because the first was uh, under my name, um, Basita. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And but also a lot of sing solo singles too. Yes. Uh, in general, what's the process of composing? Do you work uh, on your own or with other writers or composers? Yeah, I mainly work on my own because it's the the music always it's like I'm always doing it when I'm with 
either play guitar or bass or keys. I'm I'm coming up with stuff and then I really like the process of putting everything together. You know, if I have a nice bass line, I, you know, so so normally I make the whole track before I even start thinking about the song. I have like the track finished and then I, because I'm not, the lyrics is not, uh, that's what I have to, you know, it doesn't flow as naturally as the mm. rest. The music is easy for me. The lyrics I have to think about a little bit, uh, even though you wouldn't think so. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And then, of course, I've been working together with some rappers and uh, and mm-hmm. they're writing their own lyrics. And uh, yeah, so but mainly I, I do it all myself. Mm-hmm. And you have recently uh, launched uh, your last single, Go Play Yourself. Yes. Um, does this mean that you are publishing a new album very soon? Yes, it's uh, <laughs> on the way. So uh, there's going to be uh, some singles through this summer and then uh, by fall I expect the, the album to drop. I don't have a I don't have a date yet. So mm-hmm. but uh, it's going to be in the fall. Good news. Coming, <laughs> coming, back, coming back to the single Go Play Yourself is a very very funky song Thanks. with a clear Prince vibe. Yeah? Oh yes. <laughs> As, in fact it contains some lines from the song Kiss. Yeah. Uh, is this, I guess, uh, a kind of tribute tribute to your former boss? Is it? Yes, for sure. It's uh, you know, it's I learned so much from playing with him, and uh, this uh, it's a guitar part, and it's uh, I think just about the most funky guitar riff ever, and you know, it's it's kind of my go-to thing. When I get a guitar, I just start playing that because I love it so much. Mm. And uh, I was like, I got to put this in a song, man. So, <laughs> yeah. So that's, yeah. Uh, Ida, your album, Turn It Up, which is this one I have here, oh, cool. was published in 2016, the same year of uh, Prince's passing. Yeah. And some songs seems to be very influenced by his music. Um, well, in fact, show me what you got, which is a track that I love, mm-hmm. by the way, uh, was mixed by Prince. Um, was he involved in any other songs in the album or did he give you any recommendation? No, that was the only one because unfortunately he passed before I, I got mm. uh, further with it. But, uh, you know, he he helped with the mix in terms of telling me <laughs> to clean up the, you know, I had all these things going on and they yeah. like, get it off and, uh, you know, just focus on the main stuff. And so he, you know, he had, uh, yeah, he helped me correct the mix. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it sounds fantastic. I like this, this song mm-hmm. very much. Cool. Um, but let's go to the very beginning with Prince. How and when did you get to work for him? And can you tell us how was how your first meeting with Prince uh, was? Yeah, yeah, it was very cool. Um, you know, I've I've always loved punk music, so this is, uh, um, you know, to get that call is is, you know, he's like <laughs> the the biggest one, in my opinion. So it was really, even like half year before I, you know, when I started doing my this uh, my own stuff first one of my friends was like but you know what do you want why are you doing it what is your dream and I was like my dream is to play with Prince so it was <laughs> like I felt it was really a, a, a dream come true, oh, true. Mm-hmm. yeah so it was fantastic so mm-hmm. yeah I got a call one day and it was his manager at the time who called me up and and invited me for uh, a jam in the Minneapolis or Minnesota mm-hmm. and uh yeah uh yeah, long story. I went there, <laughs> and, I, and I had no idea what was going to happen because nobody told me anything. It was very, you know, there was no info anywhere. And then, yeah. <laughs> uh, I met John Blackwell in the elevator, and I was like, wow. "Are you John Blackwell?" He's like, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, I was, and then I asked him, "Do you know what's happening?" And he, he was like. No, nope. no. Nope. <laughs> All I can tell is like, be prepared and be at your best. And I got really scared. <laughs> so, uh, 
but uh, then later on uh, that evening, um, I went to, uh, I got picked up and went to Paisley Park and then immediately uh, when we went to Studio A and Prince was already there and so was John. And then the first thing that happened was, you know, I'm from Denmark, I came with my hand, I was about to say uh, <laughs> good day. And then he was like, here we give hugs, not hands. So he gave me a hug and uh, and it was, you know, it was just pretty cool. And I remember I thought I'm hugging him too long. I'm hugging him too long. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, he was just being sweet and uh, John was there. And then obviously I was quite nervous. And then he asked me about my bass, I think, just to make me relax. So he was mm. he was really being super sweet and he wanted to see my bass and I showed him, he was like, can I hear it? And when I started playing, he was like, then he said to John, hey, the drums are already hooked up. You can just go and play along. So John went into the drum room and started jamming along. And then Prince started, he had a keyboard. He started jamming mm. along. And then at a point he started to play like a, a, a thing with a bass line that was a little off. Cause I think he wanted to check if I can catch it. Mm -hmm. And then we mm -hmm. were jamming for that. Uh, <laughs> I think we were jamming for about 20 minutes and then he was like, yeah, we're going on tour. Are you available? So, <laughs> oh my God. And, and that was it. And then, you know, I was there for three days and uh, we're hanging out. And the next day we had like a proper thing and went to the sound stage and I had a complete meltdown and I didn't remember anything. And then, uh, but then the third day it was, it was better and I was more, you know, calm and, mm -hmm. And then it ended with him uh, giving me a CD and saying, call me when you know it. So uh, <laughs> there was a live show and uh, yeah, and I went back to Denmark and learned everything as fast as I could mm -hmm. and called back. And then we went, this was in August and then we went on tour in the fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you remember those first rehearsals and live shows with him and the band? Um, <clears throat> Well, the first rehearsals was, you know, it was uh, the MPG and they were already, you know, they were already, they already knew everything. So I yeah. had to catch up mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had a lot to learn. So it was a little bit, uh, there was a lot of pressure for me to, you know, I think I had about a month to learn everything because first I learned that whole show and I was like, mm, cool, now I know it. And then I come to uh, Minnesota again for the proper rehearsal. What it just keeps on being new songs, new songs, new songs. <laughs> and, I was like, what, what? and then I find out the whole thing with it. You know, we have a new set list every day, and we know mm. it just around the sound check time. And I was like, what? What? That's not possible. And uh, <laughs> so there was uh, in the beginning, I had a little bit of a some pressure to learn everything, uh, but then. Like we had the first shows with, uh, was in Europe. Uh, mm. it was, this was 2010 in the fall, and mm -hmm. um, we played some Europe shows, and then we went and and was gonna do New York, the Madison Square Garden shows, and then we did the Carolinas, and we did uh, Los Angeles, and by the time we did the Carolinas, that was in March 2011, I felt like now it's now I got it. You know, I knew all the songs and, you know, I was also, you know, not panicked about because he really liked to, you know, switch it up and sound <laughs> like this on the spot yeah. and, you know, switch to something else. But, you know, at, at that point, I felt comfortable with it all and it was fantastic, you know, mm -hmm. because the band was so great and it was so tight. Yeah, and, yeah like know, a family, completely, right? Completely like a family mm -hmm. and uh, to... Uh, to experience the way he would direct us live and arrange everything live is was just like I learned so much. It's you know, I, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for yeah. it. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, how was the process of recording a song with Prince? Was he open to suggestions or did he give you specific instructions? Uh, both. I tried uh, both where he's he's like, um, he has something completely specific in mind for one mm -hmm. part of the song maybe. And then it's more free for some other parts. So, uh, you know, when when he was very specific, that was what you did. Mm -hmm. And uh, when when it was more free, I would just play 
uh, whatever I would play. And, you know, if he didn't like it, he would let me know. <laughs> <laughs> and sure. or if I couldn't play exactly how he wanted it to, you know, he could do it himself. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what did you learn from, from Prince as a bass player and musician? Oh, dude, I learned so much. It was, um, I almost don't know where to begin, but <laughs> I mean, he was very specific how he wanted me to play bass. So I learned to play like as or as close to how he would play it. I think, uh, I think the more overall musicology, uh, uh, um, uh, or musicality of him is mm. is what what I learned the most from because it was I mean it was amazing the compositions but also how he would arrange stuff live is yes. really what mm. I think I took the most uh because he would switch it up you know it was always be like a level higher than everything and and sometimes we would do some really long pieces and And he would go so into details with stuff and I would be like, what, this makes no sense. And then when you hear like <laughs> the finished of it, I was yeah. like, okay, it's genius. Yeah. So he had like, he had the whole story in his mind nice. and, yeah. you know, gave us little parts. Uh, and then it's not until we get the full picture that it, that it actually, you know, everything <laughs> makes sense. And it there was sense. a lot of that. So it, it was, uh, it was, um, It's. I'm so grateful for that because I feel like I learned so much. Mm -hmm. So I'm using that with my band too. I'm doing a lot of medleys, and I'm kind of <laughs> feeling like it's. I have direct access to like how I feel like he would, uh, he would have arranged stuff or mm -hmm. like something similar, and uh, you know I'm pretty sure he would appreciate all that. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's. I'm happy. I'm happy I learned all that. And then sure. this is something I say in all interviews. I, I feel like the most important thing I learned is his uh, presence because he was always 100% in the music. It was yeah. like, um, yeah, you know, I tried to play gigs. I didn't like so much. And uh, everybody, um, every musician have tried it. But I never had the feeling with him that he wanted to be anywhere else than where he was mm. right in the moment he played that, the shows, and that that what made it that's what made it so magical, because um, not only for for us the musician, I mean, it gave us also like it gives an extra level of soul to the music. I feel like you could just feel it, and that's I think also what the audience feels when they hear the, sh the show, that they really sense that complete in the music uh, mm. thing he had. So, I mean, that that was created the magic. And that it's, I don't know, I mean, Purple Rain is a song that I played so many times. And, you know, you would on normally playing a song, I don't know, maybe a thousand times, maybe more, mm. you know, you would get tired of it and mm. I never got tired of it mm. I never got tired of any of the songs because they 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 stayed clean and crisp and new because it was always a new experience playing mm. them so you know I think that's that's the most uh fantastic thing to to try to do also I try to do it too but you know I, <laughs> you know <laughs> it's not always easy <laughs> Wow, beautiful. Um, yeah. what, what do you think Prince learned from you? From me? I yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he knew everything beforehand, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I like to think that he learned something, but uh, yeah, I don't know what that would be. <laughs> for sure, for sure he learned something. Hmm. Some little tricks you do with your bass, something. Sure. Oh, yeah, maybe. Well, yeah, uh, you, you took part in many songs in the album Hit and Run Phase Two. Yeah. Being one of them, a Big City, which mm -hmm. is a song that it's perfect for us. We loved it. Uh, 
there are a lot of musicians involved in that song. What mm -hmm. do you remember of that recording? Well, I remember we recorded it several times. The, but that whole album is uh, is like a collection of songs we recorded in different periods. Mm -hmm. Some of it, um, I remember we recorded uh, in in LA. Just I was in LA with John and him mm -hmm. doing uh, finishing up on Andy Allo's uh, album. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which we recorded in Switzerland, but it was all 2011. We did, did uh, those recordings. I think we did the first recording of, of Big City in LA, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then nothing happened. And then later on, when he did the big band, uh, mm -hmm. there was another recording <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> in, at Paisley Park. So, mm -hmm. and I think actually uh, the recording of um that ended up is a mixture of those two recordings mm. because all the horns are definitely from the paisley part but the bass part and uh, the drums are a mixture of, i mean the bass is a mixture of uh, me playing bass and prince playing bass mm -hmm. but i remember Gouchet playing bass in paisley park and i was playing <laughs> guitar so and, and, and those things are not in it's the old recordings that mm. that we use so it's really a, a mix and i think mm. a lot of the songs uh, are are from probably from that i think also too young to dare we also recorded in la mm -hmm. and um yeah so it it's a little bit from here and there mm. Mm -hmm. interesting <laughs> mm. we had the chance to attend the the concert at the Montreux Jazz Festival in 2013. Oh, yeah. And we know that uh, all the band had to rehearse uh, for several months at Paisley Park. How was life there in Minneapolis during that period, uh, surrounded uh, by such fantastic artists? Yeah, it, you know, it was great because also, um, all of a sudden we were so many people there, you know, the, all the horn players and the, the band itself was bigger. Uh, mm. So it was just uh, more lively and more fun. You know, we were just uh, doing, yeah, we were just hanging out more. I mean, mm -hmm. we were always hanging out, but there was more people to hang out with. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a difficult question, I guess. What are your favorite memories of playing live with Prince? Oh, there's many. Because, of course, the the very first show I ever played with him is, uh, is very mm. dear to me. But also, at the same time, I was really a little bit uh, in shock <laughs> and trying to remember <laughs> everything. So I was not able to completely enjoy it. But mm. I remember the feeling that the band had been in Paris uh, rehearsing for a week without Prince. Mm -hmm. So we were rehearsing with him in, in Minnesota before, but the, the week before the tour, he was not there. So we were rehearsing. And actually on the first show, that's the first time he joined us again. So the band do the whole thing. And then, but the feeling from being in a band and everybody in the band was amazing players. So in a very, very good band, and then still feeling when he joined that it just sounded like 10 times better just because he was there. Like what he added to the whole presence of everybody and the music was, uh, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And so, so that's of course very special to me. And then every time we played in Denmark, of course, <laughs> has been a uh, special, um, because we played our my second and third show ever with him was in Denmark and oh. then I was still not able to completely enjoy it. But then we went back in 2011 and did the MPG festival. And at that mm. that time I was uh, I felt like completely comfortable and it, we had two days in a row and it was uh, I loved it, you know, it was, you know, coming back and with confidence and all that. So, uh, <laughs> and then later on in 2013, we also played with Third Eye Girl in mm. Denmark and also, you know, so all those Danish shows I remember for sure. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's been so many 
highlights. Mm. Like, for instance, when we did all those uh, LA shows, uh, it was, you know, there was a lot of uh, guests on stage that were, you know, fantastic mm. also. And then I think also something I should uh, mention that's been quite important to me was that we played the White House with for uh, mm. sure. President Obama. And mm-hmm. uh, it, that was... Uh, Stevie Wonder came and joined wow. us for a couple of songs. It was just amazing. So, wow. you know, it's just, there's just a whole row of fantastic memories. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ida, your voice in Danish is heard at the beginning of Artificial Age. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask you what exactly you are saying in that part of the song and also how Prince suggested you to, to do that? Uh, well, uh, basically, he gave me the what he wanted me to say in uh, in English, and uh-huh. then I had to translate it uh, oh. mm-hmm. to Danish and say it in Danish. I don't know why he wanted it in Danish. I think he wanted it to be a little mysterious or something. I don't know, but <laughs> you know. So I translated it and I I I did it, and mm-hmm. it's uh, well. Let's say uh, I don't remember exactly what I was saying since I haven't said it since <laughs> okay <laughs> but, no uh, worries uh, it was something like ladies and gentlemen uh welcome to class or back to class ah, yeah. and you're yeah, about yeah. to experience something you never heard before mm-hmm. uh, and then it ends up with uh open up this cage okay mm. And you also became a member of Thrive Girl that you mentioned, uh, together yeah. with, with Prince, Donna Grantis, and Hannah Ford. And yeah. the band meant a radical change in Prince's style towards a more rock-oriented one. Yeah. And how was the band created? Well, uh, we did not know <laughs> that he was creating <laughs> a band, to be honest. Like, one day... Um, Hannah showed up, and but this was normal. I've I've had there's been a lot of people coming in just for jams, like mm-hmm. uh, and you know in and out. And I met a lot of musicians, and sometimes, mm-hmm. uh, uh, like there was this uh, guitar player, like acoustic guitar, Andy. Oh, that's embarrassing. I forgot his his uh, last name. Andy Mix something. He's amazing. So he came and. Uh, Then um, he he went with us on the Australian tour and opened for us with his mm. his thing and um, so all the time there had been people coming in for our auditions and, and stuff so it was it was not it did not mean that there was a band happening at all <laughs> necessarily so one yeah. day Hannah showed up and uh, we jammed a little bit and then I didn't see her for a long time and then half a year uh, later. Uh, Donna showed up <laughs> and then Hannah was there also and I did not know they were going to come I just um, I was just called in to do a, like a jam mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, it turned out later that Prince had asked Hannah to find a female guitar player I didn't know that <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah and then we jammed and um Yeah, I think, you know, it was always his uh, dream to have a girl, all-girl band. And uh, mm. also, he, you know, this is from his whole career. You see, like, how he, you know, he is so versatile. He could do everything. And mm-hmm. he just felt like, uh, I think, playing a lot of guitar and playing some rock music, you know. And uh, also because that was really what Hannah and Donna was really good at. So, uh So we did that, and but you can see how he would change up all the time, you know, doing different stuff. And actually, it ended up also Third Eye Girl. We were playing all the funky tracks too, and all the hits and all that. So, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, and as a member of Third Eye Girl, you play and sing in the album Plectum Electrum. Mm-hmm. Which are your memories of the recording sessions? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, the the memories of that is we did not know we were recording an album. <laughs> so uh, because everything when you're uh, when you're at Pacey Park, just everything gets recorded for reference. So mm-hmm. you know every rehearsal is recorded, and you so there's not anything. Uh, uh, yeah, it was it was it was just like it always was. Uh, 
mm. except it was new songs. So we really just thought we were recording them for reference. And even like when it's recording, like rehearsal uh, recordings, it's um, it was always like it was Prince. He did not want any recordings with mistakes in them. So even though it was only rehearsals, we still had to you know play properly. Mm. So there was nothing weird about uh, you know mm. him wanting us to step it up and mm. play good. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's that. We didn't know it was for an album, but we recorded all these songs and he wrote all these songs to fit the sound of Third Eye Girl. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and the thing is because, I mean, we really didn't know because we were also like, everything was set up in the same room. We were not even in the studio. Mm -hmm. So it, we had no idea. And that means um, also, even if it's only, uh, a rehearsal recording it's uh everything you know if some if one person makes a mistake the microphones are going to pick it up so we could not make any mistakes so we would have to redo it so everything is mm -hmm. like one takes mm -hmm. uh, and and that gives uh of course there's the energy of us not knowing the song so well because we just learned it but then uh on the other hand it has that completely uh, vibe of us being complete so on our toes to try to play it really right you know because mm -hmm. if you you know it was recorded on tape and if you record you know most people record on a computer and you can redo your tracks 40 mm -hmm. times and you can you know w when everybody else left you can still redo your bass part or, mm -hmm. or whatever but this, this was not the case here so it has a little bit of a you know extra energy to it because of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Third Eye concerts were very special for the fans. They were mm -hmm. incredible shows in small venues with amazing set lists. Which are your memories from those concerts? Oh, we did so many, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you, what I remember was like he, he you know, if it, it was a different vibe from the MPG because all of a sudden it was... Uh, we played different music and the music was made for us as opposed to uh, being some older songs that we played. It was really like new and fresh. And I, you know, I think he really enjoyed it and he enjoyed the whole vibe of, uh, of playing those club gigs because it, I think it reminded him of when he was starting up, like playing small old clubs and having that feeling mm. of being close yeah. to the audience. And then, also the whole intimacy because we were a smaller band. So we were just really hanging and, uh, you know, having a good time with each other. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> there is a rumor <laughs> about a second Third Eye Girl album kept in the vault. <laughs> is it a well-based rumor? What, what well, can you tell I don't us know about? about an album, but I know that we recorded more tracks than what ended up on the album. So, mm. you know, I think, and I will also say that uh, we recorded two beautiful songs, mm. like very, very, very good songs that I was disappointed didn't make it to the album. Mm. So um, that's all what I have to say about that. I hope those songs will be released for sure Someday. because uh, they're, they're definitely release worthy. Mm -hmm. And what do you miss the most uh, about working with Prince, Terry Girl, and the NPG? Uh, you know, I, I miss the whole vibe of it, of course. And, you know, the family, you know, when you work closely like that, uh, creatively with other people you really become family and you know now I live in Denmark and we're like uh, all over the oh, I'm sorry mm -hmm. uh, all over the world and uh, and so I miss the, the I miss the you know being tight like that and of course I miss Prince and uh, yes yeah, we yeah. all do mm. yeah and uh, yeah okay that's it um, Ida, uh, it's a fact that Prince loved working and playing with women, you said that, um, uh, as he also mentored many women. Uh, in which ways do you think that he contributed 
to empower the female female musicians. Oh, but he he did that all the time. He empowered all of us. You know, it's uh, uh, he empowered all his band members, women, uh, female and male. And I think you know yeah. it was it's fantastic. Like I I love that because it was it was not he could have done whatever he wanted, but his band was always a, a big part of his performances and his, uh, yeah, his, um, yeah, the, the concerts, the shows. And, you know, I've, I've been to other uh, big star shows where you don't see the bands, you know, the bands are hidden away and maybe there's some uh, singers, but, you know, it's like, but he would really feature his bands. Like everybody would get a spot and, um, everybody uh, uh, would get a little uh, room to shine and and he would like also all the singers would get uh, uh, their their spot you know so so he empowered all of us and uh, gave us a, a you know a, a chance to show that uh, girls can also be great musicians and and he was he was just very generous um, mm -hmm. with his band I think yeah, we, we spoke to Shelly Ye recently, well, last uh -huh. year, and she, and she said the same, that he yeah. was very generous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Ida, we have a project uh, called Purple Music's Time Capsule, where people, um, Princess former collaborators, are sending messages to the fans of the future, saying uh -huh. why Prince was so important for the world and for themselves. Uh, would you like to send your message? <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, is it? Is I just say it now? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, oh man. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just. Uh, this is. I have to try to comprise everything into a very small thing. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, Prince is um, so important uh, to the world, to us all, because of obviously his musical genius but also what he did with the music how he would unite people uh like f from like all kinds of different people uh, he would really uh, be able to unite and everybody would feel the magic and the love and i think that's the most uh, uh yeah i think that that would be number my number one thing to mention out of a million <laughs> Okay, that's beautiful. Uh, and Ida, I'm learning to play bass myself. Hey, so I'm just a beginner. I'm not playing, <laughs> of course. But what's your advice for people who, like me, are trying to play such an exciting but difficult instrument? Well, just keep going, you know, uh, and find bass lines to learn that you like, that you enjoy. So mm -hmm. don't keep it like something you can uh, you know recognize the melody in that you like to play and then just play a lot and have fun with it the most important thing is to, to for it to be a pleasure thing and not mm. a duty you know mm -hmm. okay i'll do it i'll do it <laughs> yeah do it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much thank for being so much. with us today Ida. it's been a pleasure <laughs> thank you we i hope thank to you, see you. Yeah. Yes, we are looking forward to seeing mm. you live here in Spain. Take cool. care. Yeah, you and too. Thank you so much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.